and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a lecture uh, that will be about my work in part. Um, and really I, what I want to pose to you is, is there a potential for GM animals in food production? And I want to try and, uh, first of all, introduce why I think uh, we need to think about uh, use, of, use of genetically modified animals in food production. And uh, I'll do that by a very brief introduction to the issue of food security. Uh, before I talk about genetic modification, I want to talk about animal breeding because animal breeding has been extremely successful in uh, developing food animals up until now. And for those in the audience who don't know what genetic modification is or are not quite sure, I've got a very short uh, introduction to what genetic modification is. And then I'll move on and talk about genetic modification in food animals using three examples. The first one will be example of work from my own lab, an avian influenza resistant chickens. And I'll talk about the EnviroPig, which is a potential environmental benefit by genetic modification, and the Aqua Advantage Salmon, which is uh, where GM is being used to improve the, uh, the output of a, a food animal. Okay, so uh, you probably read all the time about food security, which I think is a rather strange term, but food security me really means uh, uh, feeding the population of the world because we can't look at uh, providing enough food just for the UK because uh, if, uh, as the world's population grows, we all compete for the resources of food. Uh, and this is a graph from the United Nations, which goes from the population of the world from 1950 to the predicted population in 2050. And uh, as you probably all heard, yesterday was the day that the seven billionth baby was born. Uh, so we're at about seven billion people now, and we're projected to reach nine billion people in the world by 2050. And this growth in population is not going to be in Europe, which is the bottom down here, but it's going to be in Africa, which is the grey colour, and in uh, Asia, the blue colour. Uh, and the, even if the prediction is, is slightly wrong, it's almost inevitable that the population of the world is going to increase very significantly in the next 40 years. And as the population increases, the demand for food will go up, and these countries are also increasing in wealth. And as people get a bit better off, one of the things they want more is more meat in their diet. So there's going to be inevitably a, an increase in demand for uh, animal food products for human consumption. And this contributes to what John Beddington, who's the UK chief scientist, calls the perfect storm, that we've got competition, whoops, competition for land use, uh, population growth, which I've just mentioned, we're beyond peak oil, we need sustainable economic growth, freshwater scares, climate change is going on, there are emergent pests and diseases, and the population is <coughs> ageing. Uh, <coughs> and I think if you've been to prior lectures, you'll have heard about some of these issues. So the, uh, but the issue that uh, that I'm addressing is the uh, production of food for the developing world, po the increasing population of the world. So uh, I said I would introduce animal breeding because animal breeding has been very successful in improving the productivity of the animals that we eat. And uh, I tend to use chickens as my example because that's what I work on. And this is the red jungle fowl from Asia. And the, chi the chicken that we eat has been domesticated uh, from the red jungle fowl. And domestication first happened about uh, over a thousand years BC. Uh, and uh, people kept chickens and gradually improved them just by you know, looking at them and deciding this one was better than another one. And then uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, genetics was discovered, invented, and people began to apply genetic selection but some idea of what was underlying what they were doing. And uh, then genetics has got more and more sophisticated, uh, the population genetic approach. Uh, and in the chicken, uh, we now have two basic breeds of chickens. Chickens fall into two groups, the layer chickens and the broiler chickens. And these are an example of two birds at about six weeks of age. So they're the same age, but these birds here are being selected to be prolific egg layers 
and this bird here has been uh, selected for meat production. So this is the age at which a uh, chicken will be killed for, for meat, whereas this uh, chick will be raised until it lays eggs at about six months of age, and then the expectation is it will provide about 300 eggs per year. So from a rather attractive bird, we now have birds that provide to us uh, very significant food resources. And uh, here are some data on the effects of the efficiency increases provided by animal breeding. Uh, in broiler chickens, the, day, the uh, breeders measure the days to two kilogram weight. And in the 1960s, this was about 100 days. By 2005, it was 40 days, uh, an, in, increase of six, or an improvement of 60%. And this figure here, the feed conversion ratio is very important. And food conversion ratio is how many kilograms of food you need to get uh, a kilogram of chicken. And uh, in the 1960s for broilers, it was three kilograms of food gave you a kilogram of chicken. <coughs> 2005, it's 1.7. It's now 1.5, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and layer hens, as I mentioned, uh, we expect them nowadays to give us about 300 eggs per year in the 1960s. It was 230. So that's an improvement of 30%. So genetic selection, uh, by taking the birds that lay more eggs every time you, you go through a generation, etc., or measuring the food conversion efficiency has been extremely effective. And uh, another issue that's been covered in previous lectures is the emissions, the, the global warming potential of, uh, I don't know if, uh, if the, the, produ the production of methane and so on from uh, farm animals, particularly cattle, was mentioned, but methane, ammonia, and nitrous oxide are uh, global warming uh, gases produced by domestic animals. And the genetic selection, um, really largely because of the selection for improved feed efficiency, has led to a decrease in the global warming potential, that's a GWP here, uh, of both layer and broiler chickens. Uh, so these data here are from uh, the improvement between 1988 and 2007. Uh, and the global warming potential of a layer chicken and a broiler chicken have both decreased by about 25%. So genetic selection has and continues to be very uh, successful in improving the product quality uh, and the output of domestic chickens. And you can get similar data for other farm animal species, although uh, the chicken leads the way in terms of feed efficiency. Okay. So I'm talking about, about farm animals, and this uh, graph, which you can find on the web, uh, gives you the numbers of animals that we consume. So in a year, there are about 293 cows in the world, 1.3 billion pigs, and 52 billion chickens. So we're talking very, very large numbers of, of these animals. So if we're uh, going to carry on feeding the human race, uh, we want to be as efficient uh, in terms of uh, input and output uh, in, and productivity in these animals. Okay, so I want to take a little step aside uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page on uh, what genetic modification is. So genetic modification is the introduction of new genetic material into, in our case, an animal. Uh, this material may be a new gene or maybe another sort of uh, manipulation of the genetic material of the animal. And this new gene may come from a range of sources, so we could uh, isolate a gene from one species and put it into another, or we can uh, synthesize DNA and we can synthesize genes, so we can design a gene that we want to put into an, into an animal. And uh, these changes are heritable. So once an animal's been genetically modified, it's like it has an extra gene, which is the one you've put in, and uh, they're usually inherited, as all the other genes are. And uh, the important thing to here is that with genetic modification, we're aiming to make genetic changes that can't be made by genetic selection. So they can't be made by the traditional methods of animal breeding because the variation isn't there uh, to give you the trait or the gene that you're looking for. And uh, this is a simplified version, but how do you make a genetically modified animal? Uh, so you make a DNA transgene, uh, 
by gene cloning. So that's taking, isolating maybe a gene by molecular methods from one animal species or synthesizing it in a test tube. And you introduce that transgene into an egg or an embryo of an animal so that it's incorporated into the chromosomes of that, that animal. You then have to assist the embryo to develop normally and breed from the uh, resulting animal and identify any that have taken in your transgene. So to just give you a simple example here, so uh, every animal has a cell with a nucleus and the, and the uh, chromosomes, and the chromosomes uh, consist of uh, an array of genes. And you can come along with your molecular uh, scissors and isolate a gene. So in this case, uh, if this is a human chromosome and uh, we want to uh, uh, isolate the gene for growth hormone, we can isolate the gene for growth hormone and amplify it in a test tube. Oops. <coughs> and then here, this is how you would make to introduce that gene into a mouse. And this is a mouse egg. And here you can see the, the two pronuclei of the mouse it's egg. It's just being fertilized. And the DNA encoding the growth hormone gene, in this case from a human, can be injected into the nucleus of the egg. And this is somebody carrying out that manipulation. And then the egg will be implanted in a mother uh, and uh, any mice born from as a result of this manipulation will be screened to see if they've taken in the gene that you added. And uh, this is an example where this was really done. Uh, and this is a paper from 1982, and it was a real landmark paper in genetic modification of animals, because this mouse here has a human growth hormone gene, and this mouse here, a sibling, does not. And you can see that the uh, mouse with the human growth hormone gene is extremely, is very much bigger uh, than the uh, mouse without the human growth hormone gene. And this really, uh, back in uh, the early 1980s, woke up the people who work with farm animals because they realized that you might be able to make very major changes in production animals uh, using genetic modification. And uh, uh, the, we, uh, we and others, uh, p people at Roslyn uh, and others around the world have spent a long time actually developing the technologies for genetic modification of farm animal species. And they've been uh, with a focus on um, maybe four main areas of using the technology. One would be disease resistance, environmental benefits to improve productivity or to alter product quality. And I'm going to give you examples of these first three. But I have to say there are not actually that many GM animals uh, that have been GM farm animals around at the moment, and there are none that are being used for food. So that's something that uh, sometimes people think that they're uh, being slipped onto market, but they're not available yet. So to go back to the chicken, as I said, there are 52 billion chickens hatched a year in the world. That's an awful lot. And these chickens are beset by diseases. And this slide just shows some of the viral diseases that uh, are, affect the chickens. And they include Marex disease, which is a herpes virus of chickens, avian leukosis virus, Newcastle disease, which you may have heard of, chicken anemia virus, uh, and the one that everybody will have heard of is avian influenza or bird flu. <coughs> and bird flu uh, is widespread, particularly in the Southeast Asia, but there are outbreaks. This is a, a, um, a map from the, world, the OIE, which is the World Animal Health Organization, which shows uh, the global distribution of the virus H5N1, which is the extremely virulent uh, form of bird flu, that if, birds, if chickens catch H5 or N1, uh, they usually die within a couple of days. Okay, so um, bird flu is not just a, th a threat to uh, birds, but it's a threat to people. So we know that uh, bird flu, avian influenza virus, is endemic in wild water birds in Southeast Asia. And uh, these birds don't get sick, but they produce a lot of virus, uh, and which is transmitted in water. And uh, if it gets into a poultry flock, it has devastating consequences. And the main way of control is to, to slaughter all the chickens. But people often keep chickens and pigs together. And uh, it's known that bird flu can tra be transmitted from chickens to pigs, and that <coughs> it can undergo changes within a pig and infect humans. 
but it's become recognised more recent years that uh, H5N1 in particular can be transmitted directly from chickens to humans. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the major outbreaks of flu in the world since 1918, Spanish flu in 1918, Asian flu in 1919, uh, Hong Kong flu in 1968 and the current H5N1 outbreak, uh, these are all flu viruses that have come in part at least from avian flu. So they the, in the, what we think of as human flu is derived from bird flu. And uh, these have left, led been very large numbers of people and high death rates. So 40 million people died in the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918. Uh, and uh, just to go to the H5N1 uh, outbreak, which is still ongoing, there have only been 516 cases of uh, well, that's probably gone up a little bit by now, of uh, H5N1 in humans, but over half of the people who caught H5N1 have died. And the reason this number here, the number of cases, is not so big is that it's not transmitted from person to person yet. And the, the real concern is that at some point, the H5N1 virus will change, will mutate and evolve, and will be able to be transmitted between people. And the consequence of that is somewhat unimaginable. But there's been a study done here, oh, I'm going to forget his name, uh, uh, in Edinburgh um, on the swine flu outbreak, which showed that uh, of the la uh, last couple of years that about half the population of Scotland actually were in, uh, exposed to swine flu. So you can see that flu gets around very easily uh, once it can be transmitted from person to person. Okay, so uh, <coughs> not only... Uh, is there a health problem, a health challenge with uh, H5N1 bird flu and flu in general? But there's a huge economic impact. The pandemic uh, in humans was estimated, the last one was estimated to cost 166 billion. In chickens, over 30 million uh, chickens were slaughtered in the Netherlands in 2003 when there was an outbreak of H7N7 bird flu. And in the current outbreak of H5N1, over 300 million poultry have been slaughtered. So that's an economic cost, but it's also a poultry welfare issue because uh, the birds have to be, once you find H5N1 uh, in a flock, the birds have to be slaughtered very quickly and it's large numbers of birds and they have to be slaughtered and disposed of. And it's very difficult to do humane, humanely. In this country, they'd be asphyxiated with CO2, uh, chloral hydrate may be used, or they are burned or buried alive. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a pleasant business at all for the birds as well. So what are the solutions to dealing with bird flu? You can improve farming practices, avoid mixed farming. Uh, I talked about flu going from chickens to pigs and back to humans. Uh, you can have better biosecurity, but uh, that is uh, try and separate the commercially raised chickens from the possibility of being infected by uh, flu from water, wild birds and you can use vaccination. And actually, uh, last week this paper came out uh, suggesting that there's ever evidence for a difference in the evolutionary dynamics of H5N1 viruses among countries where vaccination was or was not adopted. Evolutionary rates were higher in countries applying vaccine for H5N1. We urge a greater consideration of the potential consequences of inadequate vaccination on viral evolution. So the problem is if you use a vaccine that partly stops the infection of H5N1, you still have virus in the population of birds and it can change and it can change and therefore overcome the vaccination. So you uh, may, may control it for a short while, but you may drive evolution of the virus to a form that you can't control at all. So we now get on, getting close to genetic modification now. Uh, so you could consider uh, breeding uh, for resistance using genetic selection. Uh, but there's no evidence of complete resistance in any chickens. So there's probably not the genetic basis for selection. Or you can use genetic modification. And this long run up about uh, bird flu is, is to impress on you what a, a challenging problem it is. And uh, several years ago, uh, a colleague fr uh, from Cambridge approached me to say he had an idea about how you could use genetic modification in chickens to control bird flu. Uh, and we should consider the genetic modification option. 
And the thing about the advantage of genetic modification is that you can carry out a precise gene insertion. You can use a novel resistance mechanism. You can, make, you can uh, design a mechanism to block the infection that is not uh, present in the species that you're working with. You can characterize that change that you've made. Uh, and you can introduce it to any chicken breed. And you can co coordinate it with genetic selection. So uh, this, uh, my colleague Lawrence Tiley uh, came along and said I had developed a way of genetically modifying chickens. And he is a, a virologist and has done a lot of work with flu virus. And he suggested an approach that we could take to use genetic modification to make chickens resistant to bird flu. And I'll now go over that approach. So this is the flu virus. And uh, the important thing to know about the flu virus is that it has a segmented genome. So the genome is eight RNA molecules which encode the genes, the proteins of the flu virus. And uh, the flu, each segment has a, a similar structure. It has a five prime and a three prime end of sequences that are complementary to each other. And in between, there's a, a flu protein gene. And the sequence at these ends are the sequence that we are interested in. So these uh, are complementary and they pair up. <coughs> and these sequences are absolutely conserved across all serotypes of flu virus. So they are the same in swine flu, for example, as in bird flu. And the reason we're interested in sequences that is the conserved is that if we're going to try and tackle bird flu, we don't want the flu virus to be able to change its sequence and get away from what we're, uh, the approach we're taking. And this sequence here at the end binds the blur bird flu virus RNA polymerase with high affinity. So RNA polymerase is the enzyme that the flu virus makes that copies the genome and is also involved in uh, translating the RNA genome into the genes, the uh, to the protein products of the genome. <coughs> Okay, so as I said, the uh, flu virus has eight genomic segments. And uh, Lawrence came up with a strategy based on this paper here of colleagues from uh, his prior workplace uh, who were actually working on human influenza virus. And what they'd shown was uh, related to the replication structure of the flu virus. So when the flu virus replicates, these ends uh, hybridize and you get for each segment you get a structure like this which is called the panhandle RNA and the flu virus polymerase comes along and binds to that uh, region of the uh, RNA molecule and makes many copies of it and when you've got many copies you can then assemble many more flu viruses and you've got a productive infection <coughs> that will spread throughout the bird and then will be passed on to other birds. And uh, what the people in this paper showed is that you can make a much smaller RNA molecule that had this sequence from the ends that still hybridized with a very small uh, loop in between. And if you express this at high levels in cells, you had many copies of this molecule <coughs> in the same cell as the flu virus. But when the, uh, press the wrong one, the, R the polymerase could bind to the decoy as well as to the uh, flu virus genome molecules. But you had many copies of this uh, small molecule. And uh, the polymerase bound to these and copied them. And so it was decoyed away. The polymerase is decoyed away from replicating the flu virus. So what uh, Lawrence Tiley and his colleague uh, John Lyle did was to make a transgene, for making a transgenic chicken, expressing that small RNA molecule uh, they introduced it into a gene transfer vector, uh, and they also included uh, another gene, a reported gene called green, green fluorescent protein. <coughs> and green fluorescent protein is a, a gene from a jellyfish which glows green when illuminated with UV light. And you'll see why we use this in a minute. So they, <coughs> they created the transgene uh, and packaged that into a virus that we could use to infect chicken cells and uh, sent it up to Roslyn. And uh, we make genetically modified chickens. 
by taking fertile eggs from newly laid hens. And this is a chicken embryo here. So if you get a fertile egg, which you don't if you buy them in the supermarket, they're, they're, in, they're not fertilized. This is a little disk of about 60,000 cells. And this is the beginning of the chick embryo development. And uh, we inject our transgenes at this stage in development. And this is my colleague Adrian Sherman injecting the uh, transgene construct in the viral vector into the chick embryo in, new, in a new laid egg. And then we reseal the uh, eggs with Klimpion, uh, and these are incubated through to hatch. And about 50 to 70% of the eggs that get injected with a gene uh, survive to hatch. And we raise these uh, birds uh, <coughs> and breed from them to identify offspring of these birds that are actually carrying our gene. In this case, the, the decoy RNA that we hope will block the flu virus and the green fluorescent protein. So uh, we raise the, we collect the eggs and hatch them individually and screen the individual chicks to identify transgenic ones, genetically modified ones. And you can see now why we include the green fluorescent protein, because it's very easy to identify the genetically modified chickens. And this uh, expression of this protein has no effect on the viability of the birds at all. OK, so we uh, successfully made genetically modified birds that carried that decoy RNA. So it, they express they're genetically modified. They have the green fluorescent protein, but we could leave that out. And they make this very small RNA molecule that is very like a segment of the flu virus genome. Uh, but we wanted to know, uh, we did various tests on the cells from these chick embryos and so on to see if, we could, if you could replicate flu virus. And we got encouraging results. But the only way to tell if we were actually going to stop the birds getting flu was to take genetically modified birds and infect them with H5N1 flu virus. <coughs> so this is the experiment that we did. So the first step was to take 10 non-GM birds and 10 GM birds and infect them with uh, H5N1 flu virus. And this is done at the veterinary labs in Weybridge under high containment, I may say. Uh, and then they were split into two groups of five of each. And they were co-housed. So five infected birds were uh, co-housed with non-GM birds or with GM birds. And five infected GM birds were similarly housed with non-GM or GM birds. So what we were looking was to see uh, what happened to these birds. So what happened to the infected GM birds, uh, GM birds and the infected non-GM birds, and what happened to the birds that were kept in association with the birds that were directly infected with flu? And this is the most complicated slide. So these are, this is the data from that experiment. Uh, and on this side are the results for non-transgenic birds, and on this side from transgenic birds that were initially infected. And each bar represent a crossway represents a single bird, and the observations from infection through to 10 days. <coughs> and a bar that ends in a black or a purple means that the bird either died or was extremely sick. So if we look at the blocks of five, so this is the non-transgenic birds uh, challenge with H5N1 here, five and five. And basically, they all died, uh, which is what you expect if they get flu. And if you look at the transgenic birds, uh, the five here and the five here, they also died. The uh, yellow block is where a bird was killed to take samples. But all those may be a slight indication that they took longer to succumb to flu. It's not statistically significant. <coughs> we then looked at the birds that were co-housed with those that got directly infected. And you can see the birds that were housed with the non-transgenic birds shown here and down here all succumbed to flu. But uh, the birds over here that were housed with the transgenic birds that were infected with flu survived. Basically, they all survived. So this isn't actually what we thought would happen. Uh, we were hoping <coughs> that the transgenic birds wouldn't get succumb to infection in the first place. But what we can see here is that the transgenic birds are not passing the flu virus on. Um, and this is as far as we've got with this at the moment. But the important message here is that we have used genetic modification to ex some extent protect the chickens from infection with flu virus. If you have a bird 
that uh, does not transmit it on, you can see that you've gone quite a long way to blocking the effect of infection. Um, and we would like to carry this on to a, a, a play with our transgenes to try and make the birds fully resistant to flu. But uh, I think the important thing, one of the important things from our perspective is that well, we got a, a publication that uh, received a lot of interest in, the mail, in the, uh, many of the newspapers, including the Daily Mail. Uh, and we've talked about it, for example, I talked at a gene jury here run by Edinburgh University for a, a school children, Café Scientifique. But it's demonstrated for the first time that we may be able to use genetic modification to modify farm animal species to protect them from uh, the major diseases that not only threaten them but are a problem for the human population as well. Uh, and uh, one reason I do these sort of talks is that uh, if we're going to take up this technology, uh, people need to know about it and need to understand and at some point make decisions about whether they think it is an acceptable technology to use in a production animal because the benefits outweigh what they consider are risks or problems. So that's the end of my story about uh, GM chickens and flu, but I've got a couple more examples of genetic modification of farm animals to go through with you um, to show other potential advantages. Okay, so this uh, slide in illustrates the Enviro pig. So this is a project from the University of Guelph. <coughs> and uh, one of the problems with pigs is, is the manure they produce. They produce vast amounts of manure. I can't remember, it was, what, what was it, 1.3 billion pigs in the world. And actually one of the biggest problems with raising that number of pigs and the intensive raising of pigs is what to do with the manure because it's very high in phosphorus. Uh, and phosphorus leaches out into the, into the uh, water table uh, and causes algal blooms and all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, what the people at Guelph decided to do was to try and make the pigs able to digest, uh, the, to, to release the phosphorus that's present in their feed. So uh, pigs are, are fed corn, mainly are fed plant matter, corn, soybeans, barley. And a lot of the phosphorus that's present in their feed is in the form of phytate which is not digestible by a pig. But uh, bacteria like E. coli produce an enzyme called phytase, and that can release phosphorus from phytate. Uh, and so what these people did was they genetically engineered these pigs to express and synthesize phytase in their saliva. So that when the pigs eat the uh, corn or soybeans or whatever their feed is composed of, they actually digest the, the phytate and release the phosphorus and they use it in the <coughs> And it can reduce the uh, excreted phosphorus by 50 to 70 percent. Uh, so this is an example of where you could use genetic modification to give a trait to an animal that it doesn't have at all, um, but has uh, environmental benefit. And as far as I know, they're, um, they've, well, I know they've done a lot of studies to show that these pigs are in no other way different from other pigs. Uh, and uh, they would like uh, to be allowed to uh, use, these prig use this genetic modification in commercial pigs. Uh, and that's not happening in North America at the moment, but I believe they sent some pigs to China where they're going to be evaluated. And my final example is the aquabiotic growth hormone salmon. And uh, I don't know if anybody follows the news, but this is the uh, first uh, animal product that, has, uh, that the um, company that produces it have tried to get through regulations to allow it to be brought to market. Uh, and the aquabiotic salmon uh, expresses a growth hormone gene and this is a non-GM salmon and a, a GM salmon of the same age. So the growth rate, which I'll show the graph in a minute, is much greater in the genetically modified salmon. And uh, to generate this salmon, what they did was they took <coughs> a promoter, that is the sequence that drives expression of a protein, 
from the ocean pout fish for a, an antifreeze gene. So it's a gene that's expressed in the winter in cold, when the fish is in cold water. And they link that up to the growth hormone gene of Chinook salmon and they put it into, into North Atlantic salmon. And uh, the advantage is that the uh, GM salmon will grow much faster than the standard salmon. They don't, I think, actually reach, in the end, a, a greater, much greater size, but they, they grow much faster and they grow over the winter months when it's cold. So they reach adult size in 16 to 18 months instead of 30 months. Uh, and that's a great advantage to the producers because they, uh, the food consumption to reach the adult size is much less because they're not just swimming around in the cold, not doing very much for a long period of their lives. So this uh, growth, almonds, growth hormone salmon was first produced in 1989 and in 1992 uh, the company published a paper describing uh, the, and characterizing these fish. And then in 1993, they wrote, uh, this is in America, they wrote to the Food and Drug Administration <coughs> to say, uh, we would like to bring this to market. Tell us what we can do. And then they followed it up two years later by submitting an application for this uh, animal to be licensed for food, for human consumption, to the Food and Drug Administration. And then from 1995, they had to wait for 14 years for the Food and Drug Administration to issue guidance uh, for uh, bringing GM animals to market as food for humans. And they uh, decided that it would have to be classified as a new animal drug. And then in 2010, the FDA reviewed all the information, which is very extensive, that the company Aquabounty had uh, provided about the safety of the genetic modification to the, the animal, to the fish themselves, the safety as regards food products and the environmental impacts. And the company uh, had set it up so that the production will be uh, from sterile females and will only be in fresh water tanks inland uh, that are sealed from the surrounding environment. Because of course fish, salmon, uh, as you know, swim in the sea, if they took them and, and reared them like the farm salmon are here in Scotland, there would be a great chance that they would escape and could breed <coughs> with wild salmon. And there's a strong feeling that we shouldn't alter the gene pool in wild animals uh, <coughs> with genetic modifications. It's not uh, fish are the main uh, animal species where that's an issue, whereas I'm sure you know that with uh, genetically modified plant crops, there's a lot of concerns about intermixing between wild and uh, cultivated uh, crops. Uh, but anyway, the uh, Aqua Bounty had done a thorough job and demonstrated that they, there was no difference in food quality between their uh, GM salmon and uh, siblings that were not GM and uh, the Food and Drug Administration concluded that uh, it was safe as a food as conventional as safe as conventional Atlantic salmon and a reasonable certainty of no harm from the consumption of the food from this animal so no concerns were identified so they have said that uh, and then they uh, held a public meeting uh, and Aquabounty made all their data available to the public, anybody who wanted to uh, look at it. And, and I would say, unfortunately, the meeting was uh, dominated by people who, who were distorting the data. Um, and subsequently, in June and July, there have been political steps in the US to block the approval process, partly by the uh, congressman from uh, Alaska, who sees this fish as a competition for the Alaskan salmon. So they actually haven't reached approval stage yet and it's not clear who will ever say, yes, it's all right to go ahead. So maybe the growth hormone salmon wasn't the best product to try and develop a regulatory system because it uh, doesn't have, it has, the, the benefits are to producers and to consumers because they will uh, provide uh, uh, another s source of uh, 
low cost, high, high value f uh, food, but it doesn't have the benefit, for example, that uh, if you were using uh, flu resistant chickens where you can see there's benefit to us in terms of reducing the risk of bird flu and to the birds of reducing the risk to the birds of bird flu. Uh, in Europe, <coughs> the European Food Safety Authority is the body that will regulate whether we eat GM animals or not. And uh, they're drawing up guidelines which will probably be issued next year. And they've also put their guidelines out <coughs> to public consultation and the public comments are being reviewed as we go. So, to come to the end now, so uh, really we have to think, if we're going to use GM animals, what the risks are to the environment, to food quality and health, uh, and what are the potential benefits. Um, and decide at some point whether we think that it will be worth using genetic modification to confer traits on production animals that we will eat, that will be uh, of benefit in terms of providing food security to the UK and improving the output of food animals uh, in internationally. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to maybe know in the questions whether you would consider eating a GM animal derived food. And lastly, I just wanted to thank in particular for providing slides and information, uh, my col collaborator Lawrence Tiley, uh, Chris Warcup of KTN Biosciences and uh, Dr. Alison Van Eenenum, uh, UC Davis, uh, and uh, many of my colleagues at the Roslyn Institute. Thank you so much, Helen, for that kind of remarkable lecture. Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, listening to these lectures, I'm impressed. Uh, not only about with, with fear at the kind of challenges that face us in the future from a variety of sources, mm -hmm. but also deeply impressed by the kind of ingenuity and the excitement of the science that is available to kind of meet these challenges. And yours is a great example of that. Thank you. But I, th I think you're, you're uh, willing to answer some questions, yes, so absolutely. we can throw it open to the audience. Hi. Right up the back. Um, you mentioned that the uh, avian influenza was endemic in the wild population, but that they don't get sick. I um, was just wondering why, well, why isn't that the case? Uh, nobody knows yet, but uh, people are looking, uh, are comparing the uh, response of ducks, which get flu but don't get sick, with the response of chickens, which uh, get sick. Uh, so I think we will know uh, in the next couple of years what the difference is in response to the virus. It's very clear that the response on infection is very, very different. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. But I was wondering there at the very end, you mentioned uh, what you, you mentioned risks, and I was wondering what you thought as a, as a professional involved in genetic modification, were the risks uh, large, and what you thought were appropriate steps to control those risks? Um, I think, uh, scientifically, uh, I think that the risk should be, as a scientist, I think the risk should be small because we're making a very precise change that we can fully characterise. So we should be able to, first of all, predict before we start what the, the issues might be, and then we should be able to analyse the animals after genetic modification. Uh, in terms of flu, it's slightly different because we do have to consider uh, whether if we make the birds resistant to flu, that we don't want to do something like antibiotic resistance in, in people where we make the birds resistant to flu, you might drive uh, evolution of the flu virus and you might end up with a more uh, virulent virus. So we need to uh, model that and test for that very carefully before anything like this is uh, included, taken out into uh, animal breeding. Um, the other risk that so that's that's sort of the scientific risk um, and I, I think also the import the other important thing is that we do have regulations and so that we do get a de decent set of regulations that make it possible to take genetically modified animals into the uh, animal breeding and production but will uh, identify any that do have problems so that they're stopped before uh, before they 
get too far. But if I may, I mean, how long have we got with bird flu? The, the, uh, the mortality of it is, is frightening. The mortality is frightening, actually. I think uh, I feel... Uh, I find that much more terrifying than the risk of uh, genetic modification. And, uh, uh, and in a way, I think we're, we're playing around a bit too much, really. We ought to be putting a lot of effort into this particular application uh, and uh, working on a much bigger scale with it. Uh, good evening, Helen. Thank you Hi. for the talk. Uh, please excuse this question from a physicist who knows nothing about genetics. You mentioned in passing that uh, using inoculation drives the virus to evolve. How does that happen in simple terms? How does the virus know? It's, it's not really, it doesn't really know. It's, uh, the, so the flu virus um, uh, has, has, has uh, these eight segments and one of the things that can happen is if you have two different sorts come in to uh, infect somebody at the same time, you can swap bits of the genome around and get a different virus. Uh, and it doesn't know. It's just that there are so many viral particles in an infected animal or human that uh, if some of them have a, a slight difference, which means that they, they're not affected by the vaccine, they will go on and replicate and replicate, whereas the ones that are af affected by the vaccine will, will disappear. So it's really a lot of it's, uh, it's a numbers game. OK, thank you. Um, the examples you've given us tonight, the, pro the, the problems you're addressing really are those associated with factory farming. Um, would it not be better to go back a step and, and take a look at the way we do breed animals and maybe eat less meat and, and encourage people to eat more vegetables and plant produce um, to address these sort of problems? Because I think the, the diseases you're talking about are more prevalent in factory farmed animals because of the cramped conditions they're kept in and the fact their immune systems are compromised. Um, I think I would uh, take issue slightly with the um, that the animals are, are compromised. Uh, that the, bird, the birds, if they're really kept inside, don't get flu because they're not exposed to it outside. And um, free-range birds have more infections sometimes than uh, birds that are housed inside because they're in a much more controlled environment. But you do have a point. We could, uh, and we almost certainly will, actually have to switch from eating so much meat to less meat and eating more plant products because, you know, if you use a kilogram of, uh, you know, chickens at the moment eat high-quality wheat, uh, and although they're very feed efficient, you don't get as much as if we just eat the wheat, not the chicken. So that's a, that's a very valid point. But I was impressed at just how feed efficient they are. It seems remarkable. It is what remarkable. About. Yeah. What, what's the limit to that? They must be close to the limit now, I would have thought. I think they, they're more interested now in uh, whether you can still raise chickens but use lower quality grain or, or lower quality plant products to feed the, feed the birds by either treating the plant products with enzymes or manipulating the mi microbial environment in the chicken gut so that you can you know, feed them less lower quality and leave the wheat for, for people to eat directly. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, you mentioned that there were several different applications of genetically modified animals um, for environmental, for disease resistant, and for you know, making them bigger. Um, I was wondering which one you thought was most likely to be approved first. Um, I'm not sure. I think because uh, our, our flu resistant chickens well, are not fully resistant, so it's not ready yet, and uh, we would need to you know, we'd need to go back and work with a breeding company to introduce them into a, the, the stocks that are actually used for production. So it's quite a long time that that would take. Though I've been told if we had something that really worked, it would take about five years, and then would have to go through licensing, I guess. Um, I think the aqua bounty fish might be, but the company might go bust before they get permission at this rate. So I think that, that, that uh, you know, the um, plant, GM plants, uh, there was such a negative response in Europe uh, to GM plant crops, although uh, they're grown extensively in the US. All the, the animals we eat all come from a small number of breeding companies and they've been very, very reluctant to get involved in genetic modification because they thought that might, you know, people might take against it and stop buying their products even before they introduced a GM. So GM animal development uh, uh, has all lagged way behind the development in plants. 
So I think it's going to take a while, and I'm not sure what will come along. And it may come along in China, for example, where the pressures there to feed the population are much uh, stronger than here. Thank you. Um, my question is about the economics of this. Um, these are new technologies, and therefore, my guess is, would be patented and therefore expensive. Um, and you're proposing this as a solution or part of the solution to the population explosion of which you demonstrated on your graph is going to affect low and middle income countries, most of all Africa and um, Southeast Asia. Um, so I just wonder how poor countries will afford these new technologies and is this really truly a solution to the problem? I, I think certainly in chicken I think the flu resistance is because uh China, for example, is, is getting more and more um, consolidated in production of poultry, and India as well. Um, and I don't think that the value would have to be in, in, of each individual bird would have to be enhanced very much for whoever implemented it to get a very good return because there are so many birds. So I think uh, it, it, it would increase the cost of those birds, but their, back, their, out, their productivity would also be increased, so there'd be a greater return from them to the producer. Uh, I don't think it would be, it'd be I, as far as I can tell from talking to breeders and so on, I don't think it would mean that they were not available um, to the, to the, the uh, developing world. I also think there are, also, there are interesting uh, routes, like, like using some of the big charities to uh, work, which I know are, are happening, for example, um, NSF and Gates Foundation are uh, supporting some work looking at uh, developing resistance for sleeping sickness in cattle in Africa. So there are a lot of different routes that they could be introduced. Exactly. If, 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 if I'm right, I mean, there's a lot of science goes into your first transgenic chicken, but once you've got that, yeah. then actually yeah. it's very old science producing lots more. Yes, yes. Yeah. as the vaccination, which is you don't want uh, the modification to allow the, the, the virus uh, to evolve. And yeah. uh, how is that technically possible? Well, well, let me go on. I actually remembered to put the, another slide in. So, so the, uh, the decoy strategy is very nice because um, I mentioned that uh, the polymerase binds to the sequence at the ends of every segment of the flu genome. So if, uh, this is a slide Lawrence Tiley made. So if this is the uh, polymerase and it normally binds to the decoy, which is very short, or the flu virus, which is the flu virus segment, which then can't bind the polymerase. Uh, if you mutated the polymerase so that it couldn't bind the decoy, uh, whoops, wrong one. It also wouldn't be able to bind the genome. And if you mutated the genome so it matched the polymerase, you'd have to have, would have to be a second mutation so they would match. But then all the other segments wouldn't match. So for the decoy, for the flu virus to overcome the decoy, you would have to mutate the polymerase and the sequence at the end of the genomes all together. So they would mutate away from the decoy together. And I think the, uh, we haven't actually calculated the likelihood of that, but the likelihood is extremely small. So that's one of the reasons this is a particularly attractive uh, approach. But I think if we did begin to use genetic modification to protect against diseases, uh, you would have to work with the breeding companies to introduce a genetic, one genetic modification for a certain number period of time and then change it. So it would be like switching antibiotics. You would, would, wouldn't use the same one for 10 years. But you would maybe use one for two years and switch and switch so that uh, you wouldn't uh, be so likely to drive evolution of the virus. These would be chickens with pink feet. And stuff. <laughs> yes. um, <coughs> ch 
thank you. Uh, changing tack slightly, I know that a lot of traditional breeding recently has been on improving animal welfare, hmm. and I was wondering if there'd been any GM work on that issue at all. Um, trying to think, I don't think I can't think of any examples of directly just just for the animal benefit. I think uh, a lot of the I think the breeding companies have become increasingly sophisticated, so that they're now taking into account some of the problems that have been brought about to the you know the ph physical constitution of the animals and are, are changing their breeding programs to to get over those problems. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the risks of um, the genetically modified genes uh, getting out into the wider gene pool, for example, with the large fish you were talking about. The fish, I think, uh, so fish are the most likely, uh, and there uh, with the salmon, the, the proposal is that they would never be reared, they would never be sea reared fish, so there would be little chance of them getting out. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in uh, Cuba, for example, in tilapia, which is also a freshwater fish, which is uh, f farmed. Uh, and I think uh, there aren't, you know, there, there are not, they're reared where there are not wild ones for them to get together with. So, um, but sheep and chickens and pigs and cows, you know, there aren't really wild a animals of those species out there. So it's, it's much less of a risk than with some of the plant crops where there are related species that you can get hybridization. So I think it, it, in animals, it's not so much of a problem. The fish, it certainly will have to be uh, properly regulated. Okay, well, it's been a really stimulating evening. Can, can, can I ask half all this? Thank you very much for a kind of a wonderful, exciting evening. <laughs> This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.